enjoyed by millions. Once upon a time, there was a prince who lived in a palace. He fell in love with a fair young maiden and he asked her to marry him. On a summer's day, with the queen and all the royal family, they drove in carriages through crowded streets to be wed at the church on the hill with their friends from many nations around them. Once Upon a Time is the 29th of July, 1981, and what you will see now is no fairy story, but the story of two very real young people beginning their life together in quite a real world and doing so not as they might well have preferred to do, quietly and privately, but in front of the eyes and ears of the world, sharing their day of happiness with us all. Such cheers, drowning the national anthem played by the band of the Welsh Guards. Horses from Holland, Oscar Roland and Peter, and one Oldenburg gelding called Bon, presented to the Queen in 1978 in West Germany. And they're wearing the Queen's state harness. Behind that standard party, the open carriage of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, with her Prince Edward, who is such a tall young man now, and one of the Prince of Wales' supporters today in the wedding ceremony. There, the Duchess of Kent, and the Duke of Kent, and their children, Earl of St Andrews and Lady Helen Windsor, now 17. Princess Alice, Duchess of Gloucester, 80 on Christmas Day next. The Duke of Gloucester, the Duchess of Gloucester, and the Earl of Ulster. So the Queen's carriage procession moves along the Mall, 
while within St. Paul's, the procession of foreign crown heads meets inside the west door. There, the unmistakable figure of King Olaf. Princess Grace and Prince Albert of Monaco. The Prince of Liechtenstein, His Serene Highness Franz Joseph II, who has reigned since uh, 1938. Beside him, Princess Gina of Liechtenstein. And as they move to their place under the dome, so they arrive at the steps of St. Paul's, these charming bridesmaids. <laughs> and there's the star of the show, or the two stars of the show, Kathy Cameron and, and little uh, Clemmy Hambro, the... Oh, isn't that a sweet sight? Queen's procession is now along the Mall, receiving royal salute from the foot guards below the summer trees. And at Buckingham Palace itself, behind the Queen's procession, now comes the procession of the bridegroom, the Prince of Wales, with a Prince of Wales escort awaiting him outside this centre arch. In the 1902 state, Landor made for another Prince of Wales who became King Edward VII. And what cheers will await him as he appears in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace and receives his six-bar royal salute. With him, Prince Andrew in his uniform of midshipman, his main supporter today, and, I hope, carrying the ring in an inside pocket. So into the forecourt, saluting the Queen's colour of the regiment of which he is colonel. He is dressed in the full dress uniform of Commander and the Royal Navy. decorated with flowers, everywhere decorated with flowers. And I wonder if he knows what wonderful displays of flowers and of Prince of Wales feathers he's going to find in St Paul's itself. The leading postillion, little Ernest Long, who's been for 43 years with the royal family. It's a lovely carriage, this. Slightly lighter in its coach paint than the others, and it is lined with pink satin. And I'm willing to bet that somewhere on a cushion in front of him, the men from the Royal Mews have pinned some kind of horseshoe or good luck symbol. Ahead of the groom's procession, the Queen's procession has now passed through Admiralty Arch and passed Charing Cross into the Strand, a Strand that is crowded and has been since last evening. Hat 
hats that are Union Jacks, flags that are Union Jacks. Sometimes it must be like looking in a mirror for Prince Charles as he sees all these flags with images of himself and Lady Diana on them, if he can always recognise them as himself and Lady Diana. So there they are, two sailors surrounded by the cavalry. And so, as the groom rides along the mare, so preparations for the glass coach to make its way from Clarence House. The gardens of St. James's Palace behind, there you can see, and all those who may have helped Lady Diana down and into the glass coach. And this is a wonderful moment as we wait when the coach turns round into Stable Yard Road. We will, for the first time, see our glimpse the bride with her father, the Earl Spencer, and we'll see that wedding dress which has been kept such a wonderful secret. There we are. Here's really a wonderful fairy tale sight. The bride on the right hand side and her father, a very proud man on the left, the eighth, Earl Spencer, who's been at St. Paul's almost every day for the last week, attended all the rehearsals, listened to the music being rehearsed, all for his youngest daughter. And she is escorted by police, not by household cavalry. She rides to St. Paul's as a commoner, even though she is Lady Diana, and she comes back as the third lady in the land. So it's all very exciting. We now have three processions on the hoof, so to speak. Queen passing through Fleet Street, from which she has received so much attention through the years. Well, it's waves and flags and cheers today as we look up Ludgate Hill, past the dark steeple of St. Martin, within Ludgate to the dome of St. Paul's. time through the centre gateway of Admiralty Arch rides Lady Diana. There are the black pigtails on the footman's tunics. Past another Charles, King Charles I, looking comely and sadly down his own white hall. Prince of Wales, the Queen's procession, 
arrives at the steps of St Paul's and there she's to be greeted by the Lord Mayor Alderman Sir Ronald Gardner Thorpe waiting with the pearl sword to greet his sovereign and my Lord Mayor will escort the Queen up the steps and uh, all the way down the center aisle of St. Paul's, carrying the pearl sword given to the city by Elizabeth I, who came to St. Paul's to give thanks for the defeat of the Spanish Armada all those centuries ago. And here is the scene, the Guard of Honor from the Three Services drawn up, the statue of Queen Anne, and all the carriages of the royal family. Queen and her mother, who came to St. Paul's on a happy occasion last year. There's Prince Edward. Hasn't he grown? He's going to be perhaps the tallest of the royal princes. Through the step-lining party of officers of the three services, Royal Navy, Royal Marines and the regiments, with which Prince Charles has been associated, and inside, what a panoply of colour awaits. The Dean of St Paul's, on the right-hand side of the door, who is the host for this occasion, there the pearl sword carried by the Lord Mayor. The Queen greets the Dean chapter of St Paul's, and the Archbishop of Canterbury in his new coat, which we're seeing for the first time today, made of silver material, which he was given, material made in 1920, and he has chosen this wedding to wear it for the first time. Princess Anne with her husband, Captain Mark Phillips. the site as the Prince of Wales escort moves round into a roadway which is called St Paul's Churchyard. There's the blue railway bridge down there, Blackfriars. Beyond that the river fleet flowed from Hampstead to the River Thames. And so the horses slowing down to uh, take the last of the Bray up Ludgate Hill. A steep Bray. And these are all horses which pulled the state coach up here in Jubilee year. Experienced horses with uh, the names of cities, Sydney and Cardiff, Rio and Santiago. And the Queen's procession is just beginning to move through St Paul's. of Wales arrives at the steps of St Paul's as the bride passes Temple Bar and enters to the city of London. Footmen stand by as the Prince Andrew and the Prince of Wales alight from their carriage. Ascend the red carpet, which uh, comes all the way down from the west door to where the bride's carriage will draw up. Through the step lining party of officers of the three services, a last wave to the crowd, wearing the ribbon of the garter, garter blue, greeted by the Dean of St. Paul's and by the chapter. 
Cannons, Cannon Collins there. The Archdeacon of London nearest to us and the new Bishop of London, the Right Reverend Graham Leonard in that splendid uh, pictorial uh, cope. And there, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, and you see now his new cope and mitre, it almost outdoes the bride. I don't think it was uh, designed by uh, Emmanuel's there, but it is very splendid. And uh, what a nice tribute to wear such a cope for the first time at an occasion like this. Queen's procession, the Queen following the uh, sword of the City of London with her, the Duke of Edinburgh, takes her place to the right of the platform, acknowledges the bride's family on the other side. here the small procession of the bride moves along Fleet Street the bridegroom with his two supporters now Prince Andrew in naval uniform and Prince Edward in morning dress, smiling to all these friends who surround them on either side of this long, long aisle. Led by gentlemen ushers, and behind his private secretaries and his equerry, members of his own small household walk with him. And the family await the slow procession of the groom trumpet tune is by Henry Purcell, who lived in the 17th century. And here is a scene that outshines any of the old scenes of pageantry of centuries ago. Two senior bridesmaids, India Hicks and Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones, who is a very experienced bridesmaid. She was bridesmaid to uh, bride's sister and uh, also to Prince Charles' sister, Princess Anne. She was the only bridesmaid on that occasion. It was one page, Prince Edward. But today we have the delight of all these children awaiting this great moment as we await it now. As the bride's procession arrives, it will receive no royal salute whatsoever. The Guard of Honour comes to attention. Guard of Honour found by men from HMS Southampton, from RAF Brodie, and from the Royal Regiment of Wales, the regiment of which Prince Charles is Colonel in Chief. Earl Spencer, too, waving to the crowds. And we await the moment when this glass coach, which we can see without periscopes, comes to a stop at the bottom of the steps of St Paul's. The door opens, and for the first time, we see in all its glory that dress.
the bride is greeted by a fanfare sounded by the state trumpeters under the portico of St. Paul's. She takes her father's arm and Earl Spencer, who was so seriously ill so recently, had a very serious cerebral hemorrhage, but who with great courage faces this day, not just with courage, but with relish and with enjoyment facing the long walk all through this cathedral. And that fanfare was the first notice that the bridegroom would have, that his bride had actually arrived. The bride's mother and brother await changes to trumpet voluntary the Prince of Denmark's March by Jeremiah Clark who was organist of St. Paul's in 1699 to 1707 the procession of the bride begins and the groom and his two supporters make their way with a longing look westward to the steps of the dais under the dome And she is not doing as so many royal brides have done. She is not throwing the veil back, so there is an air of mystery about her as she quietly walks. This takes this longest and happiest walk she will ever take. see the picture as the bride on her father's arm led by the dean and chapter of St. Paul moves through this congregation of three and a half thousand people to the east of the dome followed by her little train of bridesmaids and pages Donald Cameron of Lock Eel and Lady Cecil Cameron, watched with much amusement by the royal family and delight, because how splendidly they're taking this long walk. And the pages in naval uniform behind.
the marriage service is introduced by the Dean of St. Paul's, the very Reverend Alan Webster. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate instituted of God himself, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church. And therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly, or wantonly, but reverently, discreetly, soberly, and in the fear of God. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Primate of All England, <coughs> Dr. Robert Runcie. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Charles Philip Arthur George, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony. Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Diana Francis, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband? to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony. Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I, Charles Philip Arthur George. I, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Diana Francis. Take thee, Diana Francis. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish to love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. Bless, O Lord, this ring, and grant that he who gives it and she who shall wear it may remain faithful to each other and abide in thy peace and favor 
and live together in love until their lives end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed, I thee wed. With my body, with my body, I thee honor, I thee honor. And all my worldly goods with thee I share, and all thy goods with thee I share. In the name of the Father, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name that living faithfully together, they may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring given and received is a token and pledge, and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Charles Philip Arthur George and Diana Francis have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands. I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully, with his favor, look upon you, and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace, that ye may so live together in this life, that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen. Now a new anthem by Professor William Matthias. Words from Psalm 67. Let the people praise thee, O God. Yea, let all the people praise thee.
now the lesson will be read by the Speaker of the House of Commons, the Right Honourable George Thomas, MP. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. While the choirs, joined by the trumpeters from the Royal Military School of Music, sing the anthem by Parry, I Was Glad, composed for the coronation of King Edward VII, the last prince to be married as Prince of Wales, the bride and groom will move through the choir to the high altar.
Coggan. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in our earthly lives you speak to us of our eternal life. We pray that through their marriage, Charles and Diana may know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you send your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of all your people. Open the hearts of these your children to the riches of his grace, that they may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, maker of all things, you enable us to share in your work of creation. Bless this couple in the gift and care of children, that their home may be a place of love, security, and truth, and their children grow up to know and love you in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Reverend Dr. Andrew Derrick, moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Now the Reverend Harry Williams. O oh God, you who are the giver of all happiness, you are the giver of all love. We thank you and praise your name for the love you have given to these your servants, Charles, Prince of Wales, and Diana, Princess of Wales. Bless and enrich them in their joy. Grant that they may continually grow in their understanding and support of one another, so that their home may be to them a sanctuary in which they may constantly be renewed. Give them the courage to meet the responsibilities of their life of service to this kingdom and commonwealth. And when, as all people must, they have to encounter times of hardship and trial, give them the wisdom and strength to bring them through victoriously. We thank you for all they mean to us and will do for us. And as we rejoice in their happiness, Grant us all to see that it is in the service of your self-giving love alone that true happiness can be found, as was shown us by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Reverend Harry Williams, the Community of the Resurrection of Murfield, former Dean of Chapel, Trinity College, where Prince Charles was a student. Now a hymn chosen by the bride, I vow to thee, my country, the service of my love, to the music of Gustav Holst.
Trinity make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Now all shall rise to sing the national anthem. Anthem in a new arrangement by the director of the Royal College of Music, Sir David Wilcox. Now the Archbishop of Canterbury with the primatial cross will precede the bride and bridegroom to the Dean's Isle for the signing of the two registers, the Royal Register and the Register of St. Paul's Cathedral. The music is the march from the overture to the occasional auditorio by Handel, played by the organist of St. Paul's, Christopher Durnley. As Lady Sarah walks into Dean's Isle through God of Honor, the gentlemen at arms, so Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, move behind the Dean and Chapter of St. Paul's with the Queen Mother, with Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, Princess Anne. 
and the members of the bride's family to the Dean's Isle. Earl Spencer, Mrs. Shankin, Ruth Lady Famoy. And while the registers are being signed, we shall hear the Bath Choir, the Bath Choir of which Prince Charles is present, musicians from the orchestras, the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, the English Chamber Orchestra, the Philharmonia Orchestra, with Miss Kiri Tikanawa, soprano, John Wallace, solo trumpet, and John Scott, organ continuo. In the last aria and chorus from Samson by Handel, let the bright seraphim in burning row.
the veil is thrown back and we can see the Princess of Wales. And so, honor done to Her Majesty, they begin the long walk to the great west door and the great welcome that awaits them outside. The music is Pomp and Circumstance number no. four in G by Sir Edward Elgar, played by the musicians of three orchestras of which the Prince of Wales is patron. The orchestra of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, the English Chamber Orchestra, the Philharmonia Orchestra, conducted now by Sir Colin Davis, music director of the Royal Opera. We see the pages in their naval uniforms of 1863. Naval uniform of 1981, Prince Andrew. Prince Edward in morning dress and Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones, who's coped so wonderfully with that magnificent train. as I said, Clemmy Hambro and Cathy Cameron, looking absolutely delightful. Sarah Jane Gaisley is there and India Hicks as well. A cap holder appears with cap and gloves. The bride now has her wonderful bouquet of flowers again. And when they arrive at the west door, what a welcome there will be, because outside we have heard all during the wedding ceremony, the almost medieval cheers every time a vow was taken, every time a blessing was pronounced. The cheers rang out and came to us through the stout walls of this old cathedral church. Listen to this welcome. John Miller, who knows a great deal about carriages and horses, perhaps not so much about rides train. But certainly Lady Sarah does. She bundles it in in expert fashion. And the Hicks, the granddaughter of Earl Mountbatten, honorary grandfather, as uh, Charles called him. And the bells of St Paul's ring out. Castilian riders in their Ascot liveries, the footmen in their state liveries. The royal family come from the west door, the Duke of Northumberland there, the Lord Steward with the wand of others. And 
this is where people have been sleeping on the pavements, staking their claims since early Monday afternoon. Well, they've been rewarded now. Queen Mother, who looked a great deal at the young couple during the service, wishing them well, I'm sure, because she knows the feeling to ride to church as a commoner and come back as a royal lady. And so London now sees for the first time their royal highnesses, the Prince and Princess of Wales, as they move off from the forecourt of St Paul's past the statue of Queen Anne to Ludgate Hill. So held through the centre archway into the quadrangle. Out of the gaze of the public, but we still can see this procession coming home. 
round within the quadrangle, within Buckingham Palace itself. That bit of the palace that we don't often see. And there's waving from the inside windows from royal staff who await even now within the grand entrance to outriders, grooms from royal mules. The horses' hooves echoing under the glass canopy. There you see the footmen in their red plush breeches, pink silk stockings, tricorn hat, the crown aquarium there. First time she's got to be come used to being Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales. Her husband's trying to do his first bit of uh, helping with the train. A smile, especially for us. Princess of Wales to look out on this sea of human beings who now will feel, will feel that they in some way own her. And what a marvellous moment for these two little ladies. Kelly and Kathy and India Hicks and Baby Sarah Armstrong Jones. So the whole family, parents, attendants, looking as far as the eye can see to the Fargus Square. know that they've been out. Come on. Young Edward Van is uh, taken into the wings. little Kevin Hambro, blonde blue eyes, isn't that a picture, looking out at these vast crowds,
that's what everybody's been waiting for. Hand clasp from his bride. Excitement, Princess Anne. Uh, she's probably got to get her own back from last time. And there, Princess Wales' sister there, and there, one of the supporters. Ah. And there's movement inside. The escort moves. And in file, they approach the center archway. And we'll see that disciplined crowd of royal household and staff. Rush forward, as we can see. There are the guests waving them up. Members of the royal household, and they're covered with confetti and with rose petals. There they go, the rose petals, thrown by the children with great vigor. And there you can just see that the Princess of Wales is in a small straw tricorn hat. There she is, looking almost like a coachman herself, trimmed with the pink ostrich feathers, pale coral pink silk dress, short sleeves, the silk organza collar with frill, and a cummerbund waist, which you can just see now, designed by Belleville Sicily. And there, from the back of the carriage, Inflated silver hearts, blue and silver. A wonderful sight, catching the sunlight, and each one has Prince of Wales feathers upon it. And all the family standing in the forecourt, waving them off. Everybody's there. And so, as they drive away along the Mall, everybody's still standing in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. Standing and waving, Princess Margaret. The whole royal family.
and there uh, the heraldic device unfortunately it's not easy to tie old shoes tin cans or kippers to the rear coupling of an electric train but we can stand on the platform like survivors on the seashore of a long day waving throwing a handful of good wishes after them for many years of health and happiness far beyond the points at Clapham Junction and as they leave far behind them an exhilarated exhausted London whose royal day began all of nine hours ago the signatures on the cathedral marriage register far from meaning it's all over for Prince Charles and his Diana mean that for them as for any newlyweds, the adventure is just about to begin. May they carry the memories of this remarkable day with them for the rest of their lives to cheer them on their journey into the unknown. <laughs>